so I, let me, I, I'm going to just start by telling you uh, what is a prosthodontist. Uh, actually, uh, a, a, a prosthodontist is like any specialty in dentistry. Uh, once you finish your, your general practice uh, dentistry, you go and you study to become a prosthodontist, you, or like any other specialist. You may have heard of orthodontists who actually straighten up the teeth, and the dentists that do root canals. Uh, you might have ha heard of, of uh, pedodontists who actually treat kids. Well, prosthodontist is a smaller specialty, uh, dare I say, and we're very little, we're very few on, on in the province of Quebec. If you actually count us, we're about 48 uh, prosthodontists for all the province. Actually, two of these prosthodontists work here in this department, in the Department of the Jewish General. We have Dr. Raviv, who's the, uh, the head of prosthetics in, in uh, the faculty uh, down at A024, and myself, who work here part-time when, when I'm not in, in McGill University. So what do we do? What is it that we do? We, all, we, we actually see patients that have, uh, that have uh, missing teeth or patients that have broken down dentition. And our goal when we see these patients is to provide them and bring them back to full oral health. We want to bring them back to, to a status where they can function properly and that we restore their, 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 their appearance. If you see here, we have uh, a patient that's missing one tooth, some that could be missing many teeth, and some that, could be, that are missing all their teeth. So our goal when we treat the patients is actually to provide them with back with the teeth that are missing, to provide them with healthy teeth, and so that they can function properly and restore their, their natural looking appearance. I'm going to talk to you tonight about a topic that is very important, and that is revolutionized dentistry or changed dentistry dramatically in the past few years. But before we get to that topic, I want just to take a few minutes and talk about things that may be more familiar to you. I'm pretty sure if I look around here and I ask some people, well, how many of you have got dental bridges? Some of you might pick up their hands, oh yeah, I have one, I've done one here and there. And some of you might actually have partials, or some of you might actually have dentures. And as a prosthodontist, that's what I do. I restore my patients to the, to the natural appearance, and I restore my patients to function by providing them restorative treatment. I provide them with crowns, with bridges, with, with partials, and with dentures. And the latest that, that comes to join in our, in, our, uh, in our arsenal of treatments is implants. We'll keep implants on the sides for a little bit. And I'm, I'm sort of like nervous because I can't go to the right, I can't go to the left, I'm stuck here. <laughs> so uh, what we're going to talk about first is things that are familiar to you. We're going to start by talking about dental bridges, things that you might, you might actually have in your mouth today. What is a dental bridge? Well. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about a dental bridge first. I'm going to start by talking about the London Bridge, because believe it or not, things are similar. They can be very similar. So what is a bridge made of? Well, first and foremost, we got two pillars, right? We have two pillars, a left pillar and a right pillar. And then we got this structure joining or bridging in between these two pillars. Usually that structure is tough. It's made out of metal. So we have a good metallic structure underneath to hold so it could be strong, right? But if we leave it on the metal, it looks ugly. It doesn't look very nice. So we put blocks of cement or of blocks of, of, of stone to make it look nice, to make the bridge look nice. And this is the London Bridge. Now, if you look at the dental bridge, it's actually not that different. A dental bridge is, is made by using two pillars. The pillars that we use are your, actually your teeth. We have a front tooth and we have a back tooth. We take these teeth and we cut them down. We prepare them into mini teeth, mini med, mini teeth. And then what we try to do is these teeth are cut down and prepared into a small sized tooth. And then we fabricate a bridge to sit on top of these teeth, bridge from one end to the other using these two pillars and restoring the missing space. So what, what does it look like when we cut down teeth? Well, this is what it looks like. We have two teeth that are fairly, that are completely intact and we take an actual burr and we cut down the material on the tooth, leaving these tiny little teeth that we will use to fabricate a dental bridge. And then this bridge will come and sit on top of these teeth in order to bridge the gap between the two pillars. Well, we start by making something strong. We want our bridge to be strong, so we make it out of metal, same as the London Bridge. We make it actually out of gold. 
And we, that, that gold is going to provide the framework or the structure to give us a strong bridge underneath. But you can imagine, imagine yourselves walking out of a dental office looking like this. There's one person that did it, and he played in James Bond movies. Remember him? <laughs> I think he's the only one who wanted teeth like that. But most of us don't want to walk out of the dental office looking like this. So what we do is we put porcelain, okay? And porcelain is a good material that mimics very well natural dentition. So we put porcelain on top of, the, uh, on top of this strong metallic structure because it mimics and it looks good. And it mimics, actually, our natural dentition. So this is what a bridge is made of. It has, it's, it has a very strong metallic structure, like the London Bridge, and on top of this metallic structure, we layer a thin layer of porcelain in order for it to look pleasing and aesthetic for our patients. So, let's talk about some of the advantages. Well, you can imagine, some of the advantages of, of having a bridge is you no longer have a space, and you can actually now function on that space, because you have a fake tooth being attached to the two pillars on the side. Another advantage of, of dental bridges is that it's aesthetic. Can you imagine if you're missing two teeth or one tooth in the front, every time you smile, you see the gap in the hole. It's horrible. No one wants to live with a hole. Some might find it comfortable, but most do not. So what, it actually restores that capacity or the aesthetics of a smile. Now, what most of you are almost realized by that little video clip that I showed you, is that we actually need to cut down two teeth in order to replace one or to replace the missing teeth, which could be fairly or could be considered fairly aggressive if these teeth do not need to be cut down and do not need any treatment. Because once they're cut down, it's irreversible. We cannot do anything but put a bridge on top of them. The other thing is that a bridge, as you can imagine, like the London Bridge, is joined together. So all these three teeth are stuck together. And if they're stuck together, cleaning in between them becomes much more of a challenge. We have actually fashioned these little specific flosses that you have to pass underneath your, your bridge and then floss the, the floss through and then go through. And, you can, and, and as you can imagine, it's actually a big job to just clean in between your teeth. Sometimes people just give up and don't want to do that anymore. So, Let's recap. What's a dental bridge? It's actually a fixed restoration, something that you do not take out of your mouth. It uses adjacent teeth as pillars, and it replaces one or multiple missing teeth that you have. And often enough, it is a good restoration to restore a good function and good aesthetics for you. So, let's move on and talk about another subject. What are dentures? Well, I'll, I put a little phrase, and I said that dentures will replace all your teeth. But before we actually talk about dentures, I want to, to, to talk about what happens to people when they lose all their teeth. Well, this shouldn't come as, to, as a surprise to, uh, to anybody here. When you lose all your teeth, the first thing that you will notice is you can't function anymore. You lost all the surface to chew, so you can't grind or cut your food anymore, and you actually have no function left on uh, that you can, you, can, you can use. You can't chew anymore. So this, this is actually, actually not, not a surprise. Another thing that, that happens when you lose all your teeth is you, lo you, you lose facial support. What's facial support? Your appearance changes. Your, 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 your lips actually start to cave in. And for, for some reason or another, your chin grows. And it starts getting closer and closer to your nose. And if you're not careful, this might actually happen to you. <laughs> Believe it or not, this is an actual someone who lives in London. I don't know why, I got two pictures from London. So <laughs> okay, so this can happen to you. Now, the only solution that we had in the past is to provide a denture. A denture that will, and, and as like any goal of treatment that we have when, if we do a bridge, we want to restore the function. Uh, we want our patients to eat, to function properly, and we want to restore the aesthetics. We want it to be appealing and pleasing. And the same goals apply when we want to treat patients with dentures. Now, when you have a patient that lost facial support and we treat this patient with a set of dentures, it can actually be fairly pleasing. As you can see, if I go from front to back, we've actually restored her facial support. This is plastic surgery done very quickly. And that's what my patients tell me anyways. <laughs> So, 
we actually restore the, this, this sub, the loss of support. And we actually can come, come up with a fairly nice and aesthetic and pleasing appearance. Where we fail miserably is restoring function. And a lot of my patients don't know that. And a lot of my patients don't understand that. And that is, when you lose your, to your teeth, on, on a, if you want to talk about a general amount of loss, you lose 80% of your functional capacity. What is a functional capacity? You lose 80% of your capacity to chew and to grind your food. And this is applicable only if you have the best fitting denture in the world. So if you have the best fitting denture in the world and all the gums left to hold your denture, you're actually at your best, you're, you have 20% left. So what's my advice to you? Hold on to them as long as you can because dentures are very difficult. And patients who have dentures have great amount of difficulty functioning. Some have them for so long they don't even remember what it was having their teeth. But it's a dramatic, a dramatic loss of function when you lose your teeth. So, if I add now I ask the question and, and I, can, I ask you what are dentures? Well, dentures are like crutches. They're the crutches of the oral cavity. They are actually two pieces of plastic that, have, that represent a very poor replacement for your teeth. And I put a picture of, of a, fake, a fake prosthetic leg next, next to it, because a lot of people don't see or don't understand that teeth are a, are a part of us. They are our limbs, like an arm or, or, or that we use, or a hand that we use to articulate and, and grab something that we miss dramatically when we lose it. Teeth are of the same nature. They help us eat, and God knows. Everybody knows here the way to a man's heart is through his mouth. It was through for me. So I love eating. I l enjoy food. And I can tell you, if I am going to lose 80% of my function, I will lose 80% of my enjoyment. And that is a big, big problem. So, dentures, what are they? They are a removable restoration, something that comes out of your mouth, that replaces all your missing teeth, that will restore appearance, actually, to, a, to an acceptable degree, but does a very poor job at restoring your function. So, in with our topic for the evening. It's a long introduction, but I thought it was an interesting one, because that's what I'm going to build on for, the, for the, the rest of the evening. Does anybody know who this is? Yay! Good. You know, when I was young, I, uh, I lived in, 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 in Cyprus for a few years. And I would come home every Friday from school, and the six million dollar man was the four o'clock show. So I would rush down, my brother and I, we would fight to sit in front of the TV. Nothing will take us out because the six million dollar man is on the TV. So the bionic man. And you know what we do? Our, our greatest game that we played with him. And you know how, how when, when you know, uh, the bionic man had to do this, this a heroic trick, you know what happens? This, this, the, the picture started going slower and slower, and you get this noise. It was, a, it was the funnest thing that we could watch. And we would sit there and think and guess what part of his anatomy was changed that will let him or permit him to do all these wonderful tricks. Well, I propose to you today that we live in the bionic era. Because everything that we have can be replaced. We have bionic legs, we have bionic arms, we have bionic hip replacements, we have bionic everything. So today, in my opinion, the most important discovery, and I can't say anything else because I'm a dentist, is the bionic root. And that's what we're going to talk to you about, your dental implant, your bionic root. So, what is your bionic root? Well, it's a small screw-shaped device that's made out of titanium. Now, this device is inserted or placed in the bone. This, it's left to heal for a certain period of time. And for the first time, now we're thinking not only of replacing the tooth, but we are thinking we should replace the missing root. And this will have great consequences, as you'll see in a few, in a few minutes. So it's the first time we're actually replacing the root of the missing tooth, the bionic root, or your dental implant. Why do we use titanium? Well, titanium is actually, actually a very friendly material to bone. What it will do is, it will help the bone grow around it. And the bone will go and grow around these little grooves that the implant has, and it will bond or integrate 
to the, actually, to the, to the implant. And what we'll do is they'll develop a very strong bond. So they'll hug it and actually hold on to it very, very tight so that the implant now becomes strongly anchored into your bone. So, the, if we look at the upper portion, and notice I'm just peeling away the upper portion of the implant, the bottom is strongly anchored to your bone, and the upper portion inside it has a little thread. And inside this thread, this is what we're going to use to anchor a restoration. What, what's a restoration? Or what are we going to use to anchor? Well, we're going to use to anchor the same things that we do. Crowns, bridges, dentures. And this is, we're going to use this titanium root that is going to be bonded to the bone. And on top of it, we have this little mechanism that anchors crowns, bridges, and dentures. So this is what your dental implant looks like, and this is what it could do to you. So in a nutshell, if we want to look at it again, it's a small titanium screw that replaces the root that's placed either in the upper or the lower jaw, and it bonds with the bone, and we use it to anchor a restoration or to replace one or multiple or all your missing teeth. So, is this something new? Not really. We have, we, this is not a big discovery. We've been looking for this dental implant for a long, long time. This is a skull, that I, a picture that I got from, uh, from a, actually a, a book, and it shows a skull of a Mayan, from, a Mayan, from the Mayan culture, 600 after AD. And what it shows, I, I attract your attention to the front. Do you see the fr three front teeth? They're not actually teeth. They're actually shred nails, little pieces of wood that were fashioned or cut and placed in the socket of the bone as this person lost his teeth. And I actually believe that this is the first time that someone tried to implant and restore the root. This is wonderful. This is a long time ago. And they were still trying to get or to resolve the problem that we have today, that is to restore missing teeth. Now, this went on for a long period of time. A lot of people put a lot of effort trying to find the optimal material, the bionic material, the material that's going to bond and hold and, and stay strong and, and provide an anchor for all the restoration. Unfortunately, we failed miserably. And every time that we tried, nothing seemed to, to, to hold on to the bone. And it, often enough, it just gets rejected. It just gets, doesn't, doesn't bond to the bone. Until this gentleman came along. Per Ingvar Brennemark. He's not a dentist, believe it or not. He's an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it took an or orthopedic surgeon to help us. <laughs> he's an, he's a, he's, he lives in Sweden, and he works in the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. And what he was doing, actually, he was working with little rabbits. And what he did, he had this like, little titanium microscope shaped in a screw that he placed in the bone of rabbits. And he had nothing. He wasn't even studying dental implants. What he was studying, he was looking at how, how bone heals. And he wanted to find out, well, how does a bone heal? So he fashioned this little microscope to look at. And at the end of his, his, uh, his experiments, he came to take out these, these microscopes. And he found that he couldn't remove them. They were just stuck to the bone, which is very frustrating for him. At the same time, he next to him, there was actually a dental clinic. And in this dental clinic, people were you know, talking to Dr. Bernamak, he had friends in that dental clinic, and they were explaining to him the, 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 the difficulties that patients had with their dentures. The fact that their dentures move all over the place, and the fact that they can't eat properly, and they can't function properly. So Dr. Bernamak said to himself, hey, why don't we take this little titanium screw and place it in your patients? Now, back in the 60s, you could do that without a lot of trouble. <laughs> Today, it's very difficult. But in 19... 65, almost 40 years ago, the first patient received their dental implants in the jawbone in order to stabilize and hold their dentures. And Dr. Brennemark developed a specific protocol that helped us make that possible, or, or get these little titanium implants to actually bond and we, so we can use them as an anchor. So imagine that this is your patient that I just told you about in 1965. And we are going to place an implant in this patient. So what actually goes on when we place an implant? How do we, do, how do we go about it? First, we make a small little opening in the tissues to expose the underlying bone. And then this bone is prepared. The, the, 
area for the implant is sequentially prepared according to a very specific protocol and gradually we make a small little niche for the dental implant. Now, this implant is then placed into the bone and we leave it there to heal. We give it actually anywhere between two to six months. We wait, we let it heal. And you know what? You know what happens when you break your arm? They actually put it in a, in a cast. They set the bone, put it in a cast, and they, you wait six weeks, you wait eight weeks until that, that bone heals properly before you can remove the cast. So we do the same thing with implants. We place the implant, we hide it, and then we leave it. Let it heal properly so it could get anchored and bind properly to the bone. And what actually happens is that this little bone will creep up into the threads of the implant, very close to the threads of the implant, hug it and actually bond to it. And it could become solidly anchored in the bone. And now we use this as an anchor for our restorations. Now all this sounds really nice, but some of you might be saying, oh boy, that sounds kind of painful, an opening in the bone, preparing with the bone. Who wants to go play with a bone? Well, believe it or not, it's not that painful. During the procedure itself, we give you local anesthesia. So if you, if, if you get freezing when you go to your dentist and he, does, he performs a, a filling on your tooth, we do the same procedure under the same freezing. And it doesn't, it actually, you don't feel anything. You're fairly comfortable during the procedure. Even afterwards, it's okay, you're freezing me during the procedure. But what happens to me afterwards when I go home? Well, it's actually a small survey done with, with patients the same type of survey we're hoping to do with you tonight, that looked at the, um, how, how much discomfort there is. And about a third, 30%, said that they felt some discomfort. And often enough, this discomfort was dealt with with regular analgetics. You take a Tylenol, you take an Advil, and it goes away. And it doesn't last very long. It's actually not a very big procedure. They make it sound big. But it's not very big. Now, sure, there are complications. It is a small surgery. And like any surgery, there are some minor complications. There are, and that, you know, there's, you, might be, you might have some bleeding, you might have some swelling, you might have some tenderness. But it's generally, on the whole, 9 out of 10 patients will say that this was uneventful. And thank God, because the, the surgery is actually very pleasing to have a surgery that is uneventful. So. One of the biggest or the most common question I get as a prosthodontist is, am I too old to get, to get implants? Well, actually, be, being old is not a contraindication for implants. You could be as uh, the oldest person I actually treated with a dental implant was 87 years old. And it was, he lost his first tooth at 87. And I was so sad, so sad to be the one that had to take it out for him. Because at 87, I would love to have all my teeth at 87. I would really love I brush every day, floss every day, because I'm pl planning on keeping them that long. But he lost it, and he definitely wanted that tooth restored. And at 87, we placed an implant, and everything went well. It wasn't a problem. So old age is not really a problem. Health is a problem. You have to be healthy. And you have to have enough bone that will hold the implant in place. That's very important. So your quality and the quantity of the bone and your health are very important parameters to f when, we wanna, when we look at placing dental implants. Now, being too young is actually a problem. Not too old. Being too young is actually a problem for placing dental implants. Now, as a general rule, if you're healthy enough to remove a tooth, or to go through an extraction, you're healthy enough to have a dental implant placed in your mouth. How successful are dental implants? Forget what I, what I wrote here, but I can tell you a quick, a quick answer. Nine out of 10 implants that we placed can, can stay in the mouth for almost 20 to 30 years. And we know this because a lot of people have been studying them over the past 40 years. And what they found, and they've studied implants that have been in the mouth for 30, almost 30 years. And they find that the success rate, how th their, their success is about 90% of the time. So nine out of 10 implants actually stay in the mouth for almost 20 to 30 years. It's impressive that bionic root resists fairly well. But nine out of 10 means one is failing. And that one fails depending on a lot of factors. But when a dental implant fails, this is, doesn't fail in, 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 in a very dramatic way. 
it fails only by saying that that bond that we're looking for between the implant and the bone didn't really happen, didn't really develop. And that implant, instead of being solidly anchored to your bone, is now a bit mobile. And so we just take it out, clean, and place another one. And the good part about all of this is that when we place a new implant, it doesn't mean that you have more chances for failure. It, that implant has, can succeed 9 out of 10 times, the same way that the first one had the same chances of success. So, let's take a look at someone who has a small problem that came to see me. And I'm going to go step by step with you what we've done to st for that patient and how dental implants were very helpful for him. So this is a gentleman that had a very badly broken down tooth, had a big decay, it was fractured. He came to see me. I know it looks gruesome, but it's OK. I see this every day. <laughs> so he came to see me, and he was going to lose that tooth. And like my patient who was 87 years old, and it was the first tooth he's going to lose. And he, he wasn't too happy about that. He was very concerned. Oh, I'm going to have a space. Food's going to get stuck in there. So he was, before I even took out the tooth, or before I sent him to take out the tooth, he was already asking me, how am I going to fill up the space? And if you look at these teeth, and, and if you remember, he, had a, he has a very healthy tooth on the top and a fairly healthy tooth on the bottom. He has a little silver amalgam filling in there not really teeth that would require any cutting or anything like that. And if you remember what I told you before about dental bridges, in order to do a bridge for this patient, I have to cut down two of his teeth. Two healthy teeth, I have to cut them down in order to put, in order to bridge in between them. And yes, I may end up with a, with a result that is good, that is functional and aesthetic, but I had to sacrifice two teeth to do that. Now, let's imagine this, this tooth being removed, and being replaced with a titanium root. Notice, I didn't touch the two teeth. The titanium root goes in, the crown is actually screwed on top of this titanium root. And when the patient comes back from his appointment where the tooth has been removed and we have now this titanium root in place, you see that the te two teeth next door are exactly the same. We haven't touched them. So it's a very conservative treatment because we don't have to damage teeth in order to replace we don't have to damage two teeth in order to replace only one. So you see here, the implant has a little cap or a healing cap that's protecting it during its phase of healing. And as we remove that cap, the picture to your, to your right, you see that little thread I told you about on the inside, where now we're going to screw in a fake tooth. What does this look like, a fake tooth? This is what it could look like. It's actually made out of metal and porcelain, the same way as the bridge. And you see that little screw that's passing, that's going to actually screw onto the implant and fix the tooth in its place. And when we place it in the mouth, this is what's going to look like. It's fairly nice looking, fairly aesthetic. And more importantly, the two teeth adjacent to that, sp that space that we had are untouched. And now this patient can actually floss between his teeth like they were his normal or natural teeth. And if we try to take a peek underneath, what we see is we see the titanium root in the bone. And this titanium root is actually bonded to the bone, and that tooth is screwed or anchored to this implant through the small little thread on top of that implant. So I told you that teeth, that implants or titanium teeth can be looking very natural and aesthetic, and I, suppose, and, and I suggest with you to play a game tonight. There is a bionic root in there, and there is a fake crown. Can you find it? All right. We're going to start. I'm going to help you out. I think it's this one. Ah, now we got more. Good. How many people think it's this one? Oh, we got a few people. How many think it's this one? All right. How many people think it's this one? We got some people. And this is actually a common answer. You can't really tell. So I won't let tell you. I'll let you think about it. No, that's a joke. <laughs> it's actually this one. That's your bionic tooth. Not bad. A round of applause for the people that guessed it, please. OK. So let's move on and talk about dentures, OK, and how implants can help dentures. Do you know what's the most common problem that I hear, or a common question that I get in my office? Now, I'm a specialist, so I get all, I get all the problems. That's what. That's what the, the burden of being a specialist is. Now, we get, I get a patient that comes in, and this is a common, very common. Dr. Sam, I've been wearing dentures for 20 years, 15 years, 30 years. 
Never had problems with my dentures. Everything was okay. I sold my mom six pair of dentures, and now, I don't know, for some reason, they just don't fit anymore. They just start moving everywhere, I get sores, I can't eat, they're uncomfortable. Doesn't make sense, I've been wearing them for 30 years. I should think should be getting better, not worse. How come? What, what's actually happening? Why out of, all of, the, out, of, out of the blue, after 20 years, I'm starting to get problems with my dentures? Well, there's a very simple answer to that. Let me talk to you about what happens when you age. This is a picture of someone. It's not the same person that I took pictures, but this is a picture of what happens to your jaws or to your, to your gums as you get older. The picture on the, on, on completely on the left shows someone who might be 20 years old, and he's a dentist. And as you go towards the right, what do you see? The gums are shrinking. The older you get, the more your gums shrink. Now, how, 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 is, that, how is that a problem? Before we get to see how is that a problem, let me tell you something. If they shrink on the top, like I showed you, they actually sh shrink much faster on the lower. Four times faster on the lower jaw than they would shrink on the upper jaw. And that's very important, because you lose, you're losing your bone very, very quickly as you get older. Now, I told you that in the best scenario, when you have the best fitting dentures, you will only get 20% of your functional capacity. You will only eat 20, you only recuperate 20% of what you lost when you removed all your teeth. Now that's a very big number, remember? Now this is not the best scenario. You're actually here, you're actually at a lower number. You're actually almost at 5%. You're barely capable of chewing. Now, anywhere else in the body, when the bone is put under a strain, if you exercise, your bone gets stronger. If you, if you go walking, your tendons and everything get stronger, your muscles grow. The, the mouth doesn't work the same way. When you put dentures on top of your jaws, it doesn't get stronger. It actually gets weaker, and it shrinks away. So, how can dental implant help us? What is actually happening? When you were young, you had a big ridge. And this ridge was resisting all the forces that you would put on it. Your denture would move, but you had a big, high ridge that was resisting. As you got older, this ridge got weaker and smaller. But not only did it get smaller and weaker, it got flatter. So now, the same amount of force that you're trying to put and chew on that tooth is actually displacing your denture. So it's moving away. It's not being resisted by anything. And there's a famous saying by doctors. You know this one? Now, at dentists, we're not very, uh, very bright, so I shouldn't say that, it's being taped. <laughs> but, so we borrow the same saying from the, dent from the doctor. A doctor away, a doctor, uh, sorry, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Well, we modified it in dentistry, and we added this to it. A doctor, an apple a day will keep the doctor away only if you can eat it. Because if you can't eat it, the doctor can go away. And instead of you eating the apple, what you're seeing in the picture is the apple actually eating you. So, how can dental implants help us? Well, they do the same job that they've done for the crowns. The dental implant is placed in the bone, and it will offer an anchorage for that denture. So now, when we put a little force on top on, on the denture, and this denture starts to displace because there's nothing holding it in place, that implant will grasp it. And it will prevent it from displacing. And that's how dental implants can help you. Now, another thing that they do, and that's a wonderful thing that they do, and this is the most important thing, in my opinion, that they do, is that they will stop your bone from shrinking. So you do not have to wait until your bone is completely gone before you think about getting a dental implant. They will actually take the forces that the denture is putting on top of your, your, your gums that are, being, that, that are bad and causing that resorption and transform it into a positive force. And now your bones are stable and they won't shrink because your implants are in place stimulating them. Okay? So, 
How many implants do I need, doctor? Because I put a little phrase at the end, I, they're a little expensive. So how many do I need? Can I get away with one? Or do I need 10? Well, if you're missing all your teeth, I want you to remember three numbers. These are actually the numbers. Now, there's a lot of variety around this, and I don't want, you to, I don't want to, you to hear you say, well, you know, I got six, and here he suggested eight. These are just the general numbers that I'm giving you that will give you guidelines of what type of treatment can be offered to you and how this can help you. Two, four, and five. So, let's take the patient that we've been looking at from the beginning that, has no, that, has, that, that is completely edentulous. The two implants are actually placed in the front of the jaw, where your canines used to be, the two, the two teeth on the corner of the mouth. And the way it goes is that these implants get placed in the region of the canine, and we put on top of these implants a little anchorage that looks like a ball. Now, on top of this ball, we'll put a little washer so that the denture can actually snap onto these implants or onto with these washers. So if you look at it, this is what the washers look like, and then this denture will actually drop into place and then snap onto your implants or onto the little abutments, ball abutments as we call them, that, that are on top of your denture. So what does this look like on a patient? This is what it can look like. There are two implants in the front, and you have these little ball abutments which is like a little snap device that is placed in the denture, and your denture actually snaps into place. Now, you've got to remember, when you have two implants only, that snaps in the front, but in the back, you have no implants. So the denture can still move a little bit. Because like a, like a table, if you have four legs on a table, it stays, it stays solid. Now, take the back legs out, it will wobble, right? The same thing happens. <laughs> You have, the, they'll hold it in the front, but in the back, there's always a little bit of wobbling. Now, some people don't like that, and that's why we go up in number. That's why we add more implants. Now, you should know, when we actually fabricate a denture, with implants or without implants, it doesn't make a difference. The actual length of the treatment is the same. The difference is the amount of time that we'll, you will need to place the implants and then for let them to heal before we fabricate the denture. But the amount of appointments that it will take to actually get your dentures done is about five appointments. You can add one or remove one depending on, on the amount of time that, or the, the people that you see. But in general, the amount of time is very similar to fabricating an actual denture that doesn't have any implant. So, let's talk about four. We put four implants because we want that denture to be more stable. And on top of these four implants, we put a bar. Now, what does this look like? What does the bar look like? Don't be scared, it's made out of gold, so it's actually worth a lot of money. <laughs> and on top of this, these implants, we put this little bar. This little bar will actually clip inside your denture. So we make a space in the denture that has little clips, and these clips will come and clip on top of that bar. Now, this, will, this denture will be very stable because we have more implants. The implants are actually occupying more space. And now you have like a table, four legs holding things together. And this, this, act, this denture actually does not move. It holds by friction, it does not move, but it still comes out at the end of the day. Now, some few people find that annoying. They don't like it. They don't want to have that denture come out at the end of the day. They just want to be done with all that's called removable or, 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 or anything that you take out. Some people don't like that. So that's why we go up to number five. We add an implant so that now the denture can be screwed on top of these implants and it does no longer come out of your mouth. So when you put five implants, I put a little picture of a denture on, on top right, it's much smaller, much tinier, and now we can actually screw this prosthesis or, or denture on top of your implants, and if you look at it, it stays in. It does not come out. I'm talking about, obviously, the lower one it does not come out. So when you place that implant, it is screwed in, it doesn't move, and if we take a peek underneath it, we see that it's connected to these implants and it does not come out. It stays in the mouth at all times. That sounds really good, doesn't it? Yay, could that be me biting that apple? Because you know how it is. An apple a day will keep that doctor away, right? So I'm going to 
I'm going to talk to you a bit about what about the science behind dental implants. And this science, I'm proud to say, is done here in Montreal at McGill University by the group of Justin Fine, the, the group that Dr. Dr. Gannon belongs to and the group that is actually hosting the survey today. So what they did was they took a group of people and they said, we want to know if these implants or if we put these implants in patients' mouth actually make a difference. So they took the group of people and they sub subdivided them in two. This group got brand new dentures fabricated by the best specialists. The other group got some implants and they got as well brand new dentures fabricated by the specialists. And then they evaluated what happened to these people. And they gave them surveys, and they gave them questions, and they asked them to answer them day in and day out as they came into month by month to after this, the treatment was delivered. And what they found was remarkable. They found, and I'm, I'm going to show you this graph, but I'm going to tell you exactly how, how it runs. What they gave them, they gave them questions, and a, they put a line on these questions, and they asked them to put a notch closer on, along that line. And the highest, the, 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 the number, the more positive the response. So the red bars are the bars that have the patients that received implants and they got a denture snapped on top of their implants. The blue bars are actually the patient that have complete dentures. And what they found was that patients are generally much more satisfied with their denture. Not only are they much more satisfied, they're actually more comfortable when they snap the denture into place. The denture becomes much more stable, and this is important because this is not something I'm telling you. This is not something that a, a dentist or a prosthodontist or, or anybody is telling you. This is what your, the patients told us. And this is why this is very important to us because we f they also found that when that denture is stable and comfortable, you can actually chew better. You can actually grind and pulverize your food much more better. And what are you chewing? You're chewing harder foods, because it didn't make much of a difference when you were chewing bread or when the patients were chewing bread. Where the difference became very apparent is when you started chewing a raw carrot which is much consistent, much harder, much more difficult to cut when you have dentures. And this is where implants made a difference. In the long run, these patients actually had a better nutrition because they were eating healthy vegetables, fruits and vegetables, and their nutritional habits were better. And not only did this impact on their nutrition, but it had a great impact on their general health. So these little titanium bionic little screws did not actually only hold the denture into place, but it stopped the bone from melting away, it stabilizes your de the denture, it made you eat better, and it made you healthier. It's a great achievement that something so little could have had such a big impact on patients. So what's the bottom line? Well, the bottom line is you eat better. And when you have implants, your functional capacity is not 20% anymore, it actually gets up there, almost to 60, 70, 80, almost as close to what you were when you had your natural teeth. Now, some more advantages? Well, you don't have to use adhesives to hold the denture anymore because it doesn't move, it's held down by the implants. You don't have to worry about the denture coming out if you smile or if you talk because it's held, held down by the implants. More importantly, you don't have any gum irritation or pain or anything like that associated when you have your, your dentures in place because the denture does not move. But the biggest challenge that the, my patients have are, is this one, is that now that you have dental implants, you have to maintain them. And when you haven't had roots or teeth for a long time, you forgot how to brush them and you forgot how to floss them. And when you get your implants, you, if you've, you have to take care of them like you had, you're actually, you took care of your teeth. So you have to brush them and floss them constantly. So I'd like to thank you for your attention tonight.